Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? I have to warn you, I tend to trail off, especially when I'm tired, and I'm very tired. So I tend to kind of like talk really loud and then slowly trail away. So just shout if I do that. So uh, I, I've started the Elm user group in Dublin. I basically, I, I started programming in Elm probably less than six months ago. So I've been sort of a bit of a language nerd for a while, and I've been sort of looking for a nice new language to play with. And Elm is, to me, a really interesting language and one worth looking at. And so I'm going to talk about it now. I, I have to warn you, I don't have any nice frog demos. Um, it's mostly going to be me talking a bit about languages. I'm going to try and keep it moving fast so it doesn't get too boring. Um, so without further ado, what is Elm? So, I mean, that's it. That's the talk, really. It's just the best functional programming language in your browser. What does that mean? So I kind of get a lot of questions about Elm. It's basically, it's it's actually a full new programming language. It's not like JavaScript with extra bits. It's actually a completely new programming language. It has its own compiler. It emits JavaScript, I'll get onto that. But it's actually a, a ML-inspired language using Hindley-Milner type inference, um, whatever that is. And it's basically strongly typed. It's actually trying to make life more fun for developers. It's actually not trying to be an academic language. It's actually trying to be a really, really useful language that you can actually use. and to do that, as I say, <laughs> it has a full compiler tool chain, so you actually do L make and blah, and, and uh, emits a single JavaScript file. So it compiles everything. The best way to think of it is like Go. It statically compiles all its libraries into one binary, um, which is a single JavaScript file you just include. And you can actually just compile it separately and treat it like a library if you want. Um, so in that regard, it's actually kind of nice to integrate. So what is Elm? I mean, so it's... As I say, it's a functional programming language. I mean, it's not, this, this basically doesn't do anything too exciting. It shows hello world. Woohoo. Um, so what this is doing is it's got a main, it shows hello world. Show is just a graphic shortcut, it just renders a string. Um, there's a type annotation here. I'll talk a little bit more, more about those in a minute. Um, funny we're talking about centering. Um, so Elm, uh, one of the things it can do is it can react to events. One of the events is actually the window size. So hopefully, I'm not going to be made a liar of. And I can resize. And as you resize, there's an event being generated Elm's reacting to, and it recenters the content. So um, it's actually well, it's uh, pretty good for doing stuff like that. So basically, this is kind of starting to show you the whole thing about Elm. It's a functional reactive programming language. It's actually his master. The, the guy who created Evan. It was his master's thesis. Can you make a programming language that takes the ideas of functional reactive programming, um, ML, other functional programming, and a whole bunch of other stuff he read, smush them together, and make them into a nice language that would be really cool for writing front-end programming in? Uh, my contention is yes, but you know we'll see what everyone else thinks. Um, here's another one. Uh, featuring my favorite operator in the whole wide world that every language needs to steal, which is the pipe forward operator. And this is basically a way to get rid of brackets. Instead of nesting brackets with 15 function calls, you can just do pipes, just like a Unix shell. And what this one does is it makes a bigger hello world. Ooh, exciting. So one thing you may have noticed is this isn't really doing HTML. There is actually a HTML DOM, virtual DOM shenanigans going on. <coughs> but Elm actually presents a c two or three different ways you can do it. You can do it like a graphic style, so it does canvas. You can do these elements, which are basically abstractions over HTML, and then you can do straight up HTML. Uh, just a quick side note, um, Elm is a, a continual struggle to balance language design. So the idea is trying to make add nice stuff, but not too much, because then it gets complicated. So that's what a large part of the Elm design is always about. And a lot of it is actually now removing features. So as I say, the Elm philosophy, and, and the reason I'm talking a lot about the language, this is kind of, Elm makes a lot more sense when you see a little bit of the philosophy behind it. Um, it's basically to make a language for front-end developers. They actually the Elm folks pretty much just shoot doing back end. They're going, well, someone will probably do it eventually, but we're not going to do that. And if it means compromising the front end experience, we're not going to add those features. So every, they, they actually say, they kind of say no more often than they say yes on the mailing list. It's actually very funny sometimes um, where someone comes in going, hey, I'm a Haskell developer. It's this brilliant language construct you've got to have because it's the best thing ever. And they say, no, it's just confusing. It doesn't make any sense. So. The other, thing, the other thing about Elm, and one thing I do recommend, if nothing else, you can watch a much better talk than my talk, which is Evan ch talking about um, the Elm language philosophy, <laughs> which is, 
I've met him, and I keep getting his name wrong, so I'm not going to risk it this time. Um, Let's Be Mainstream, where he's basically talking to a functional programming conference, basically for ML programmers, Lisp programmers, uh, about, you know, well, you know, why take the Lisp programming or the, uh, the ML people and move them into front end? That's a tiny community. Why not take the JavaScript people and move them into a nicer space? So he has this lovely access where he has sort of usability. JavaScript's way off on the right, because like you can just right click inspect, pull up a console, start learning JavaScript. And then he has another one called maintainability, and he has like Java somewhere over there, far to the left from JavaScript. And he's pointing out that one of the risks of doing gradual typing, which I know some languages are doing, um, is it may move JavaScript back on the usability axis. It goes up the maintainability, but it'll move back on the, the, the usability, and that, that's not good. So El Evan wants to actually move it up and to the right. That's his goal. Make it more usable and more fun and more maintainable. His talk's way better than mine. Watch that one. If you learn anything tonight, watch his talk and forget mine. So <laughs> I'm going to just go through a few Elm party tricks. Um, it's a nice type system. Really, I, it, it is. A uh, really helpful compiler. It's actually one of the best features. Um, it's a time traveling debugger, which sounds really cool. Uh, it has no runtime exceptions. Um, well, you can actually make it crash, but that's only if you want to. Um, that's one of the big things about it, and also has semantic versioning for shits and giggles baked in. Um, so here's a program with a mistake. Um, just don't worry too much about the syntax. Imagine those records are a bit like JSON objects. Not quite, but they are in this context. I'm trying to update a model. Uh, I'm trying to show the model. Um, and so when I run this, you get a error, which I have a nice color version here. Basically, the compiler has analyzed it and gone, wait, you're trying to update this record which has these fields with this one. Um, I think you probably have a typo here. Did you actually mean to use this name instead of that name? And so this is kind of an example of the errors you get from the Elm compiler. They put so much work into it where they actually analyze your program and go, I think you have a typo here. And it does other cool tricks like if you, misname, if you mistype a function that you've imported or a module, it actually searches all the namespaces appropriate to that line of code and goes, hey, did you actually mean this one or this one or this one? So it, it actually suggests edits. Um, here I have a typo um, where I'm trying to pass an int into a string. So Elm is strongly typed. Um, so what does it do in this case? Um, well, this one's kind of obvious. It goes, well, you pass in a number instead of a string. So this is really just a point that Elm is, is strongly typed and tries to be really helpful about it. It, it also, you can define your types and things like that, and it, you get nice little error messages. Um, another thing they do is they try to use the compiler errors as a teaching tool. So rather than giving you a really cryptic error message about, ooh, this is an unknown symbol, blah. Like here, I'm doing something which I did the first time I started doing Elm, which is like try to add a string together. This seems like a really obvious thing to do. Um, turns out Elm you're supposed to use the plus plus. And so they actually kind of spot this and go, hey, did you actually want to use this operator? You probably did because that's probably what you were trying to do. So they, they have lots of little kind of messages like that where they try to spot kind of beginning mistakes and give you a helpful error message to, to help you along. So this, this is kind of the Elm philosophy is, <coughs> is to make programming pleasant. Like you shouldn't have to fight your tools. They should actually be helpful to you. And same with the language. Like every decision is designed to make life more pleasant as a developer. Um, so I've been talking a lot about that language, um, but uh, I'm going to keep talking about the language, then I'll, uh, then I'll stop. Um, so this one, um, again, basically, you're doing a case statement, and I'm, a new, I'm switching a case on left, but I haven't dealt with right, and I'm passing in right. And this would potentially cause a nasty error. Um, luckily, the compiler spots this and goes, oh, you forgot to deal with this case. So it actually tells you when you've missed a case. And this is great when you're extending code, because you add a new... Like I could add a new action, and it will tell me all the places in my code I have to update to handle that new action, which is really nice. And it's the same for refactoring. It will actually tell you when you miss things. So this is really, really nice. Um, and since having a really nice compiler is really useful, it's, and having really good error messages is really useful, like good ideas spread. And it's interesting that the, the Flow folks in Facebook have um, rejiggered their error messages. That are much, they're much, much closer to Elm-style error messages now, so they're much more helpful. Um, L flow is actually also implemented in the functional language. I believe it's OCaml. So there seems to be a lot of good ideas there. Um, so the other thing I was going to talk about was a time traveling debugger. This one's actually a bit more interesting to watch. 
So here I have a little Mario. You can notice a bit of time passing. And I have, I have sort of, you can sort of see the thing showing symbols. Now what you can do is I can grab this and move the state of the application back. And this is a side effect of the fact that the Elm application, like Elm, everything's immutable. So it can just simply snapshot the state for the time traveling debugger and you can just rewind back. There's nothing else, there's no other state to be captured. So you can just rewind back through your application and see what's going on. So you can put little hooks in your code to watch things. And this is a really neat trick. And this is actually, I mean, it, it's, it is really handy sometimes, but it's more a cute sort of hack someone put together in a weekend as a result of watching another talk. And someone said, hey, this would be really easy to do in Elm. And this, this is kind of the stuff that they work on where they try to create tools that are useful. And by the way, oops, didn't mean to do that. Another thing, um, this is turning into a lightning talk. I'm going super fast. Um, the semantic versioning. So they, they said, you know, this is kind of a good idea. So they baked it into the packaging system. So the, when you re release a new version of your library, it actually inspects the type annotations. <coughs> That's what these are. So that they're really useful in lots of different ways. And it goes, oh, you've actually made a major change. You can't release this library without doing a major revision of the, of the code. So, and then you can also diff API. So you're guaranteed it's impossible to release a library that breaks someone's API if you do a minor release. You, can, you can't do anything like that. It, won't, it just It's completely baked into the whole thing. And also then you can diff APIs, which is really useful sometimes. And they're working on improving the documentation system to feed off this as well, so you can sort of get diffs between docs and things like that as well. Um, so this is all wonderful. I mean, you can use it right now, obviously. So there are some caveats. Um, it's still relatively new. I mean, it's... 2012, I think, was when the first release came out. Um, and it's still evolving. I mean, the, the goal is to make a good language. They're not frightened to change things. Now, they, they try to be nice about it in the sense that the compiler will help you going from version to version as much as possible. Um, like, for example, the last release, they just deleted a whole bunch of syntax no one was using. They kind of just don't need it. And also, the other thing that's a bit interesting is interop with ja other JavaScript code might surprise you at first. This is the thing I always get the most questions about. Um, so what do I mean by interop? So you create, you, you've got your Elm app, you've compiled it. It's nice and self-contained, little JavaScript file. You can create a div, start the app pointing at that div. The question is, how do you interact with it? You can't just call Elm functions because it, it's, it's like the self-contained thing. You don't get no runtime exceptions if anyone can inject stuff into there. So it's kind of like lives in its own little world. So they created something called port, ports to communicate. By the way, I should also point out there's the rewrite everything in Elm approach, which I'm a big fan of. Um, there's also a thing called native, so it's a bit like C extensions where you need to implement critical bits of Elm libraries in JavaScript, so you have like a native extension in JavaScript. That you can totally crash the Elm in runtime with. So ports, basically you declare a port, you say this port is gonna, this particular port is gonna take a string and a user record, whatever that is, it's gonna be a list of fields. And that comes from JavaScript, and then you can send to JavaScript with a string of information. So how do you use that? You basically take your IL map, talk to the ports, and you send it a object. So in this case, it's the string and the record. And what happens is Elm rejects any message that does not conform to the signatures. So it only allows in data that's good. So you do get inscriptions, but on the JavaScript side, but not on the Elm side, so that's cool. Um, and similarly, you can have a callback mechanism to emit events back to JavaScript. So this is how you'd integrate existing apps with Elm. But the thing is, it, it, this wouldn't work. This, this is like integrating a big portion of code. You wouldn't sort of have like an L map in 15 different parts of your, of your DOM tree. That would be probably quite inefficient. So this is probably going to be doing a nice big chunky L map and then talk in and out of that. So that's the big thing is that um, I do get asked, can I just simply use it as a widget library? Like, can I create a little pop-up text box and have it like that? And that? You can, but you're probably going to have like, you know, each one of those can use an ungodly amount of memory um, so that's probably not the best way. It's better to do whole components or whole big sections of your app. Oh yeah, bonus. Just because you can, he threw in a full GL shader compiler into Elm. So the language actually can com natively understands GL shaders. So you get like WebGL. Um, and again, I can sort of rewind that. And so that's actually using a vertex shader and a texture shader. And that's all. And what I mean, what I mean by native support is if you screw up one of the parameters you're passing in or you change it inside the GL shader, it'll actually throw a compiler error going, oh, you haven't actually matched up these parameters. That's, that's really neat. 
Um, there's, so as I say, there's lots of nice stuff in Elm. It's an interesting, interesting project. Um, one of the other big things I've learned more is the idea of making bad, broken code hard to express. You can use the type system to help you, and you can sort of make it just really hard to represent bad states in your app. There's this things like maybes and things like that. That's going to get more advanced kind of stuff. And one of the upshots of that is I find it needs a lot less testing because you know there can't be any other state but the ones like when it compiles, you you know that's it. There's no there's no other things you have to test. So there are tests. I mean, you test external inputs to make sure your app actually does what you want to do, but it's not going to explode on you. So that's really nice. Um, yeah, and you can use it today. Uh, stuff I didn't talk to. I mean, it's it's all about reactive programming. So there's all these effects tasks and signals and whole things. There's like there's a big emphasis in the Elm architecture on reusable components. So anyone who's kind of spotting things, they kind of go, "This sounds familiar." And so it's an interesting set of convergence that React is sort of doing the same kind of patterns as well that Elm is doing in the language. Um, so <coughs> that's kind of interesting. It's got a virtual DOM. It's got Canvas. There's no such thing as undefined or nulls, which is cool. Um, but my most favorite feature is I have been trying to learn functional programming for ages. Like, I mean, I know kind of basics, but I haven't been able to use like Haskell or Camel. And I've just been never succeeding in learning them. Like you do the tutorial and you go, that's nice. And then you try to write an app and go, ooh. And I found Elm has been my most successful <coughs> attempt to learn functional programming. In fact, it's almost like it's accidental. You just sort of do stuff in Elm, not thinking about monads or monadic constructors or lambda calculus. And then you later find out going, oh, I've actually been doing this thing all along. And that's the way you should learn stuff. You just learn, do it. And then you go, oh, wait, that's how you do it. And so you start spotting patterns. And now I can actually read a little Haskell and OCaml. And it doesn't frighten me the way it used to, which is really nice. Um, so I, I kind of would say, even if you never plan to use it professionally, and you're going to go, why the hell would I introduce a new language into my professional life? It's a fun thing to learn. And it's a fun way to learn it. Um, and you might find you just learn a, a few interesting new ideas. Um, which can be applied elsewhere. And you might really get into it. You might go, yeah, I totally want to rewrite everything in Elm. Um, <coughs> so that was my unintended lightning talk. That was way faster than I expected. I guess I'm nervous. Um, so thank you. And <laughs> questions? <laughs> yep. So what's the JavaScript output look like? Have you it's actually, that? yeah, it's actually pretty good. Um, I'll, f I'll open one up now. And it's probably going to make a liar of me. Uh, hang on. Um, it's surprisingly readable. Written with their own compiler? Yep. It's in they've got a full compiler written in Haskell. So one of the advantages of that is they don't do so much now. But I mean, this is actually the output of the compiler. So it's pretty readable. Um, one of the things they will be planning to do more of is because your code isn't mapping one to one to the output, they can start doing optimizations and other tricks like that. So. At the moment, they're not, they haven't focused on that at all, but that's one of the reasons they're doing a separate compiler. But at the moment, it, you get very readable code. And so the errors, I mean, OK, so you do get runtime exceptions when there's a bug in the Elm compiler, which does happen occasionally. And so the errors are quite readable then. Yep. Um, the official Elm tutorial is not too bad. It's it, it gets you going with a couple of basic patterns, the kind of architecture pattern. Um, I've been doing a sort of series of workshops. I'm still, they're not where I want them to be. Um, the Pragmatic Studio, they also have a couple of good courses. Um, the only thing I would say is that I know there are a couple of big changes coming in Elm. So if you're planning to learn it, it might be worth holding off a month or two until the next release because I think there's a couple of things coming down the pipeline that will make it a lot nicer. Um, I'm not going to commit them to saying what they're changing, but I believe they'll make app learning Elm much nicer. But the, the official Elm tutorial is good to play with, and the example is actually very readable. And then the Pragmatic Studios, and if you're feeling really desperate, you can try reading my workshop notes as well. Um, they're, they're all linked to my GitHub. I'm, I'll, put, I'll put the slide back up at the end. Yes and no. I mean, you don't debug Elm in the same way, really. You don't. It, it, hmm? Well, you, you, you do have the time traveling debugger for those kind of things, but I don't find I need to actually debug it at runtime. This is one of the things, it, it's as you get better with expressing your intent in the language, you find once it compiles, it just does what you expect it to do. And so 
yeah, I mean, you do have tests for that, and yeah, you can pop into a debugger. Um, it, it, I haven't. Re I, I think it does do source maps, but I've never really used. I've I've literally never had to actually go into the JavaScript debugger except one time I broke the Elm interpreter. So, apart from that one time, I've actually never had an issue where I've. I mean, I, I've actually had bugs in my code and business logic bugs, and you know, you can either th rip out a part of it and put it in the debugger, the time traveling one, or you just write a test for it or something like that. So I've, I've actually found, this is kind of one of the reasons that Evan has been doing M it based on ML, is one of the nice things with these ML languages, as you get better at expressing your problem space in them, you find the compiler just like spots problems for you and you just don't, you, d you just find you don't tend to get the same little niggly issues. Now you still get, I mean, your programs still flat out do the wrong thing. That, I'm not gonna say it won't do that, but it, you'll be less surprised with this behavior than after a while. So I. I think that's kind of one of the goals of them is to kind of spend less time debugging. Is kind of make the tool chain help you before you get to that point. Now, it may not actually happen in reality. It may turn out with a hideously complicated app. It's just not viable, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> Any questions? What, oh. what is the test framework that you're on? Uh, yeah, so there's, there's a couple of them. Um, I can show you what they look like. In case you're curious, this little project is, I have a flotilla for my Raspberry Pi, which is a bit of hardware that opens up a web socket, so I've been talking to it over Elm. And so the tests I've been writing, I've been oh, decoding the pro flotilla protocol. So um, essentially you just, y there's a standard like test to sir equal. Here I'm just, I'm, it's not a great example in sense. I'm actually take. I have a list of things I want to decode and the expected output. And I'm just mapping, I'm just doing a list map across them in a test. Um, so the test frame is sort of the, the sort of equal the thing, uh, the output and the, the action. It, it's very similar to a normal test. Framework. There's also uh, a check framework, which is based on quick check, which I don't know if you've ever seen. It's this idea of a thing that sort of explores the test, tr the potential tree of possible values that goes into your code and then minimizes it down to a whole bunch of cases and then tries to break your code. So there's that framework as well. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a very straightforward test framework. It's a standard assert. Um, you know, <coughs> sort of blah equals blah. And then you can run that in either a web browser te web test or it can use Node. There's a bit of a, th again, you can actually use Node with Elm, so there's a Node console runner as well. So it's, it's pretty easy to, to run the test in that regard. Again, if you notice this, I'm actually, I'm actually doing a lot of fiddly stuff, but I've actually only written tests around the encoding and decoding onto the wire WebSocket protocol. So what I'm spending a lot of my time is expressing the model in a way. So this, this actually represents all the devices and this sort of represents the kind of some different parts and then this sort of represents the action. So these are all the things that can possibly happen. So I connect to the WebSocket or I try to connect, I get a socket event. I also have an internal routing thing. I send a command down the socket, it's closed, there was an error. And then I have a case statement which handles all these um, and so the entire logic of the app is basically in here and the, and the compiler, when I add a new thing I want to do, the compiler will tell me where to update. So, I mean, this is really bad Elm code. Don't, don't look at this. But it, the point is, is, even though I don't really understand Elm very well, like I'm not a good functional programmer, I'm not a good ML programmer. I, it's, it's been a really pleasant experience learning Elm and then I've been ex writing a WebSocket decoder thing for a bit of hardware. It's incredibly satisfying. Um, so it's been just a lot of fun and it's been teaching me a lot. So I, I think it's really good in that regard. Yeah. The uh, question that you think is going to be broken today is kind of a question, but yeah. what's the, the framework is going to be? Um, there, there are a few different things. I mean, the simplest one is there's a couple of little things that are a bit off the beaten path. And here, this is like the, oh, this is actually very small, sorry. This is the Elm startup thing. So this is like the core pattern. The idea is you just give it an init. So like here, I'm just giving a WebSocket and an init function, the function that gets all the updates. And this one took me ages to figure out because no one ever used it except it turns out me, is I needed to feed in events from the WebSocket. Because normally a lot of the Elm examples are centered around user interaction. So it's all driven by clicks from the user. So that's where the events are. But here I was actually getting asynchronous events coming in. And it just took me ages to figure out to wire that in. And that, that's kind of a reflection of the fact that it is quite new and stuff changes and some of the examples will be out of date. So, you know, you have to be kind of, 
a bit of a willing explorer sometimes to, to do that. But the groups are very helpful. The Slack channel is really helpful. The community is just generally really nice. I think one of the things I really like about it is Evan is a really big language nerd. I mean, seriously, I met him and he gave me like five papers to read about Hindley Miller stuff saying, you have to read this. Oh, wait, to read that one, you have to read this one first. And then, but he, he's really conscious of building a good community. So he, he will say no to things that he thinks may harm the community long term. So that's really nice. So I think it's, it's going in a good direction. It's just, you know, it's very new right now. I mean, really, I think Elm in its current state has probably only really existed for the last year. It's been churning quite a bit up to now. So I think that's, that's one frustration. Also, occasionally, I just do actually run into a what the hell kind of ML language programming problem. So the, um, oh yeah, this is a good example of something. I haven't figured out if that's the right way or not. It works, but. I don't know. Um, the actually the, the what the hell thing was, if I can find it, um, was gluing together some of the events. So there's this socket, there's a this thing called a mailbox where events can go in and out. And it took me a while to figure out how to wire this together, taking that external thing and passing it through. So that a couple of things like that, a couple of patterns. Once you get them, it's quite obvious. Well, I'm not gonna say obvious, but at least you can you can do it. But it, it took me a little while to figure that out. So the for example, the Pragmatic Studios, they have two courses. They have the basic Elm, and they have one just on Elm signals because they're a complex enough topic. So that's the reactivity, that's events coming in and out, that they need, they've, they've created a very good course in that, actually. Um, is there anything else? How did you find the community? Was this the community of or, or what? Um, so Elm, this is kind of getting into the Elm architecture, which is the second talk. Basically, Elm has a notion of uh, let me see if I can find a better example. Um, Elm architecture. Actually, um, do, 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 do. Do, do. Let's see if I can find a really simple example. Okay, this should do, I think. Yeah, so Elm has a notion of a model, which in this case is an int, simplest model ever. Is that, oh, sorry, it's a bit, is that better? Okay, sorry. So Elm has a notion of a model. Um, it has an update, so this is the thing that receives events and acts on them. Um, and only, what it does, you don't mutate the model, you just emit a new state of the model that gets fed back around the loop. So this is again very kind of React style. And then finally you have a view which takes a model and then renders it. And so the, it, it, the way to think of it is your view has no persistence. It just gets the model, renders it from scratch each time, and then the virtual DOM worries about making sure that's efficient. Um, and that's it, basically. I mean, okay, there's some style stuff down there, but that's it. The view, so you can, okay, one of the other questions I do get is, is there a templating language? Uh, the answer is no, not at the moment. Actually, Elm itself I find quite good for writing, expressing stuff. And uh, what I do find is because of the way you, gr you glue stuff together, you can make components that are fairly reusable just as Elm functions, and I find that actually works quite well. Um, I've been doing some crappy bootstrap work, for example, and that, you know, I've been creating little widgets and reusing those, and I find it works quite well. Uh, I imagine it only gets better at Flexbox because I don't have to worry about a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, again, by breaking it up in these three discrete things, you can sort of think about the problems independently. You can just worry about rendering your model. You don't have to worry about any events or anything like that. It's just gonna do that. You can worry about just the actions, and then you can worry about modeling your program. I mean, this one's an int or a counter, but you can have more complex stuff. Does that help? Is it possible to <coughs> integrate Elm, let's say, with Angular application or with Ember? Because uh, actually, uh, it's, uh, uh, let's say, na nice to have it uh, yeah. because of yeah. types or uh, yeah, yeah. the functional nature. So one, there's a few different patterns. I think I've seen one person, what they did is they actually re-implemented their core business logic in Elm and then wrote a bunch of ports to glue it into a, I think a React app, but I think Angular would work just as well. So that's one possible way. Um, I mean, essentially, as long as you can call a function to send something into Elm, it will do something. It can, it, it's hard, for example, though, to pass in a bunch of divs and get it to act on that uh, sort of, because with the virtual DOM, it's sort of re-rendering the whole thing. So it's best to think of you give it a space, like a single div, it would do its thing in there. Mm. You don't worry about what it's doing. Or as I was saying, I've seen someone who just implemented the business logic. So all the rendering they kept in JavaScript and all the interactions, but they, they wanted the types just for the business logic because they're a fairly complex kind of problem to model. 
So they, they just talk in and out, like feed in the data, it did its thing. It was almost like you could almost think of it as like a, a internal request to a web server, the way they did it. And that worked quite well, actually. And they kind of liked it a lot, and they just started putting more of the UI into there then as well. So that's one possible way. Um, but it, it, it's, uh, again, it's kind of, you can't <coughs> use it like a JavaScript library in one sense, because you can't just pass in a bunch of divs and sort of let it do its thing. It, it's, it's easier if you let it control the whole region of your app. And part of the book says it provides some uh, uh, fine size framework for working with DOM. Is it that yes. virtual DOM? Is it feature yeah, it's virtual language? DOM is baked into the language. So it's a, it, the whole thing would not work if they didn't use a virtual DOM because it, we render, you effectively emit a whole new DOM structure each time when you render the model. So they have to use a virtual DOM to make that efficient. But it's actually very fast. It actually benchmarks better than a lot of other frameworks. So it's, it's one of the top performing frameworks because of that. And because of the immutability, it can make certain assumptions as well. That helps a lot. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's essentially you give it control of a portion of your, of your real estate somewhere. That's one way to use it. Yeah, so the, no, so as I say, ML is, <laughs> you're going to like this, ML stands for, dun, 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 ML. Um, <laughs> 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 so what it actually stands for is meta language, but really it just stands for ML. Oh, it, it's, yeah. It just, whenever you say ML to, to functional programs, go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing that Haskell, F Sharp, and, you know, uh, OCaml and a whole bunch of other stuff are derived from. Um, hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ML has been around since the 60s, early, oh, early 1970s. In fact, there it is. Um, so basically, the whole problem of lovely type systems and type inference and glorious programming was solved back in the 70s. Um, and everyone's just been re-implementing that since then. Um, yep. So the debugging... Um, Again, I mean, th there's this, th there's the this thing where I actually emit different bits of state in my app. Oh, okay, but you see, stepping through line by line doesn't make sense in a sense in a in a language like ML. It's so sort of state. yeah, you can uh, check the the state is the the state is the thing that goes wrong. Yeah. Um, like you can throw in debugs at different points in your app to emit different state at different points, but stepping through it, it's sort of not. Because occurring and a few other things it does, it's not really an imperative language that steps one by one. It's actually, it's sort of build, the way this whole thing works is essentially it's a kind of building a very fancy pants type calculus solution for your program and then doing a few optimizations and then running that. Because I know, for example, um, conceptually you can think about it in lots of different ways. So it, it's kind of hard to step through it line by line meaningfully in the same way. Um, but you can, and there's different ways of doing that with just this. Like you get, most of the time you're interested in the model state. You kind of go throw in a debug watch at a particular point in the app and you just want to see the state as you move it. And then, then you interact with it and go, okay, it's just done something crazy there. And that, that's where you sort of hone in. So that's one particular way. Um, yeah, so I mean, tooling is, it's sort of getting, it's getting better. I mean, it's kind of the thing I keep saying. I don't. I haven't ha f felt the need to step through it line by line. For even writing, even when things have gone really badly wrong, I sort of could it figure out. I could sort of isolate a problem and figure it out based on looking at some of the state. Because state is really because you know there's nothing else happening. Once you have your state and you look at that and go, okay, what what screwed that up? Um, you can figure out what's going on. So it, ma it makes reasoning about your code much easier, and that's one of the nice things as well. Um, I imagine there will be a line by line debugger at some point. Someone's going to do it. Probably, no, okay. yeah. I mean, um, I, I know another question is, I, I imagine it would be. I mean, there's no reason why it shouldn't work. I mean, you can run it on Node as well. Um, and I know someone keeps asking, well, what about WebAssembly as well? And the answer to that has always been, well, when someone writes a garbage collector for it, then WebAssembly is an option. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it runs in JavaScript. So pretty much anything a JavaScript app will run on, it will run on as well. But it, again, they don't want to do back-end stuff. They're focusing very much on front-end. So they, someone will probably do it, but the language won't change to accommodate that, at least until probably 1.0, and then they'll go, OK, now we can start thinking about that. It's kind of their attitude. Okay, okay. Any questions? It's actually much more interesting than my talk. 
you. <laughs> As I say, if you're gonna if you're gonna take one thing away from tonight, is uh, apart from joining the L Music Group, which is awesome, um, you should watch um, Evan's talk, do, 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 which is "Let's Be Mainstream." It's a really good talk because he's trying to explain kind of why Elm is the way it is and why they will and won't do things. And it's actually a really good talk because he basically pokes fun at functional programmers a lot. It's really funny. Um, he had a functional programming conference. Did he predict that functional products and unaccompanied programs obsolete? I don't know about obsolete, but I, mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fun way. It's a nice way to express problems. And I think it's sort of making a big resurgence at the moment because, I mean, you look at F Sharp from Microsoft, so it's a much more mainstream um, solution. And then... Facebook is doing all sorts of fun stuff with OCaml in the back end, like with Flow and things like that. So they're, they're using that a lot. So it, it's, it's making a big research, I think, partially because computers are faster, so that was traditionally a problem. Compiler, compiler research is sort of kicked off again, so the outputs are getting a lot better now. Um, but I think just a lot of people are rediscovering that it's actually a really nice way to express stuff. But I don't think it's going get, to get rid of imperative programming. I think it's just going to be another language <coughs> that a lot of people use. Hopefully more people use. Because I think it is, I think the ML languages are really nice. Like they're okay. Haskell's hardcore, but F Sharp's really nice, and then Elm's really nice. They're much more, uh, let's say, palatable versions. Okay, okay. I feel like I need to run away now. I keep getting questions. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Cool. Right. Thank you.